Good evening, good evening. Um, hope you've had a good day today. Uh, tonight's lesson is a, a fairly simple lesson. Some of it uh, is kind of repetitive, but uh, just uh, I like the title, and there's a lot of good uh, scripture in here if we'll just take it for what it is. It said, God cares for creation. And uh, it brought to my mind 1 Peter 5 and 7, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. And uh, that's one thing I love about God is if it concerns his children uh, and we care about it, God cares about it. So uh, sometimes when we pray, the Bible tells us don't pray amiss. We don't know what to pray for and God knows better than we do. And people perceive that as God not caring or not answering prayers, but that's that's not so. We just cared enough that he uh, he didn't give us what wouldn't be good for us. Amen. So uh, it says down there, God cares uh, for all of his creation. Matthew 6 and 26 said, Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds, uh, feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? So uh, it's letting us know if God cares enough to take care of the needs of the little birds, then certainly... He cares for us because we are his crown jewel of, the, of creation. We are made in his image. So he's letting us know, I really care for and love my creation, but you are at the top uh, of the pack. I, I care for you. So let's look at the lesson overview. Uh, it says, while God's creation of humans was the crowning achievement of his creation of our world, God has a personal interest in and care for his whole creation. The doctrine called deism holds that God created the universe and put in place all the dynamics to keep it functioning, but he has no personal involvement with what goes on with his creation. I think that would uh, be a sad way to believe that God just kind of placed us here and then abandoned us because the scriptures tells, uh, tells me, it said he would not leave us orphans are alone. So God is always with his children. But um, it says, however, uh, the Bible presents a vision of God who is personally and intimately involved with his creation. The Bible teaches that God rules over his creation with sovereign authority and power and cares for his whole creation by mean of prov uh, providence. Uh, Jesus taught that God cares for people, and he also cared for even the smallest birds. Now, you know, that's a God of love that can love us, but he also can love uh, the, even the smallest of creatures. The lesson outline said God governs heaven and earth. Uh, for instance, he's in control of uh, everything, how much uh, it rains. And people say, you believe God actually intervenes and causes it to rain or not rain? Well, well, the Bible said that the Lord caused it. He told Noah to build an ark because he was going to cause it to rain. So this shows us God is in control of our entire world and universe and even the elements around us. So he is in control uh, of our weather. And it said God uh, governs the universe. And this is found in Job chapter 1, verses 31 through 38, are the heavens that we see, the stars, uh, I believe that God, when he created our universe, everything was put in a perfect balance. Uh, that's the reason that the uh, sun is at the center of our uh, solar system. And if a planet were to move one way or the other, like if we did, we would either burn up if we got too any closer to the sun, or we would freeze to death if we got any further away. And, uh, you know, it makes me want to ask, uh, ask the scientists, uh, you, you don't believe there's a God, but everything in our system is perfectly aligned that didn't happen by accident it said god cares for animals and god provides for the animals again it said the birds they don't have to worry from one year to the next god provides for their needs uh, it said god rules the animals and uh we know that he rules because he brought the animals to adam and he told adam to name the uh, the animals and then he gave man dominion over all the animals on the planet. That's because God was in control, and he gave us that dominion. Said God is sovereign over humankind. Now, have you ever uh, seen people said, you can't judge me, only God will judge me. 
Well, the, the true uh, nature of the scripture says this. It says, for the Father judges no man, but all judgment is given into the hands of the Son, Jesus Christ, and he is worthy. Amen. Uh, so so we, God, uh, the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, Jesus being part of that definitely is our judge, said God knows everything. Uh, and and we're, we're talking about the book of Job here tonight and um, the, the trials and tribulations that came on Job. And Job had to realize that God was in control not only when things were going good, but when they were going bad. And it wasn't God at all that had done these things to Job. It was a test from Satan that came uh, on Job that God had allowed. But uh, it said God knows everything. And in the conversation with Job, he let him know that when he created our entire world, universe, everything in it, he said, Job, where were you at? Nobody gave me counsel. I didn't have to ask you how to do these things. And he reminded Job not only of who he was as God, but who Job was. Amen. And I, sometimes I think that the Lord has to remind us of that, that he's God and we're not, and we have to trust him. Uh, the golden text, Job 31 and 4 says, does he not see my ways and count all my steps? And the answer is yes. It says, uh, another scripture tells us, the eyes of the Lord uh, go to and fro in the earth and he watches the son, uh, sons of men. So God is very well aware of what is happening on our planet and with mankind as well as the animals today. Teaching goals, impart and reinforce knowledge to inform us of what the scriptures uh, for this lesson reveal about God's relation to and care for his whole creation, to influence attitudes, to seek to evoke a, a perception of God's care for his creation that will inspire them to be grateful to God for all that he has created. I think sometimes we lose that. The older I get, things that used to I would never think about, now I think about them. If I'm in a restaurant, uh, when I'm eating, I'll take some bread out in a napkin or some crackers sometimes. And, and when I get in the parking lot, I'll throw it to the ducks or the geese or the little birds that's out in the parking lot. Uh, because things when I was young that didn't mean anything to me, now they mean everything to me. Uh, family means more to me. Uh, our, 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 <laughs> our thinking, we change, we mature. And we realize who God is in, in our creation and, and who he is to us and what we are to him. So I, uh, everything about us changes the older we get. So it says uh, that we need to have an appreciation, uh, influence behavior, so we have an appreciation for all God has created by living with reverence for God and obedience to his word. Let's look at the historical literary background. This entire lesson is based on scriptures found in the book of Job. It is likely that Job is the oldest book in the Bible, predating in its original form the writing of the five books of Moses, Genesis through Deuteronomy. It is believed that Moses likely found and kept the book of Job in its original written form, with additions being made it possibly by Moses or other Israelite writers after him. The story of Job... Uh, predates uh, the giving of the law at Mount Sinai, uh, according to the Greek Old Testament. Uh, Job was one of the grandsons of Esau and a tribal ruler, a king of a city. And that's found in Job chapter 42, verses 19 through 21. And it says the time period was probably around um, 1600 BC. So it's been quite a while ago. But let's go to uh, let's go to the scripture now. Job chapter thirty-eight, verse one. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, "Can you imagine that uh, Job has lost? He was a very wealthy man. The Bible said he was uh, the wealthy, one of the wealthiest men in the East. And and in one day, Job lost all of his cattle. And in uh, a storm, he said a great wind or, or a tornado. It said it hit all four corners of the building, just demolished the place where his children were gathered. He lost all of his children in one day, most of his servants and uh, everything that he had. So 
he literally went from being rich to being dirt poor in a period of less than a day, and he lost all his family too on top of it. Then you know the story. His wife comes to him and said, I don't know what you've done or I don't know what's going on, but why don't you just curse God and die? But the Bible said, Job charged not God foolishly through all of this. And he looks at his wife and he said, you speak as a foolish woman. And I didn't mean it as an insult, but anybody that says we should just curse God and die, he's our creator. He's our only hope for salvation. So Job uh, maintained his integrity and he began to go in mourning and he sat in, in sackcloth and ashes and uh, for days he didn't talk to anybody. And you know the story, the old devil come against him and the Lord said, I'll let you do anything you want to do, but don't take his life. See, God is putting stipulations on what the devil is able to do. And you need to realize that as a child of God. God has the authority. He can say, this is what you can do, Satan, and this is what you don't do. Now, that ought to be reassuring to us. And the Bible says that the devil struck Job from the top of his head to the soles of his feet with sores and boils. And he began to set in ashes and take broken pottery and scrape those boils that were itching him. And, and you know... Then if things, if you would think, well, they can't get any worse, then he's got three friends that come and sit with him for the longest time and nobody says anything, even Job. And then his friends begin to accuse him. They say, surely you have sinned or you have done something against God. Have you ever had something happen in your life? And even you yourself, you begin to examine, Lord, is it something I've done that's causing all this in my life? But you know, the Bible tells us it rains on the just and the unjust. Bad things happen, uh, surely, to, to bad people, but they also happen to good people. Bad things do. But the Lord, it said, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us from them all. And that's what he's about to do with Job. But Job don't realize that even though he's, he's maintaining his integrity, he doesn't know if God is going to come through or not because things seem so bad. His situation seems so dire. And his friends have accused him and his wife even has kind of turned against him and he's lost all of his possessions. Can you imagine this in one day? But it said through all these things, Job maintained his integrity. Then he began to speak, not against God, but he began to say, when did anybody ever come in contact with me that I wasn't good to him? When did I ever let anybody leave my presence hungry? I fed everybody that ever let me know they were hungry. And he began to remind God of his goodness. Job did. Not the Lord's goodness, but Job was reminding him how good he had been. But the scriptures tell us, is there any righteous? No, not one. And the Lord intervened and he began to speak to Job. Now that's, that's what we're about uh, to see here. This Job 38 and 1 uh, Job has been talking, but now it's God's turn to talk. And when God uh, speaks, it's better than what E.F. Hutton they used to say. When E.F. Hutton speaks, everybody listens. Well, when God speaks, believe me, you'll know that it's God talking to you. So it says in Job 38 and 1, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Can you imagine you're sitting there and you're reminding God how good you've been and all this, and all of a sudden you look up and here comes a tornado right at you, a whirlwind, and it stops right in front of you and a voice begins to come out. This is something Hollywood needs to, to, to take notice of some of these stories. They would make great movies, amen? So uh, it said that he spoke to Job from the whirlwind or the tornado, and he said, God says, have you comprehended the breadth of the earth. Or do you know how big this place that I've got you living on this place earth is? He said, tell me if you know all this. You know, you know what, God, let's put it in country people terms. God is saying, what about you, Job? Are you really a know-it-all? Do you know everything? Have you ever come in contact with people and, and no matter what you were talking about or what you asked them, they knew everything about that topic? Those are what we call know-it-alls, okay? So Job, uh, God's asking him here, Job, you, you think you know so much. Do you really, do you, do you know as much as you think you do? Can you imagine how Job felt? He was probably humble even at that very second. But it says, where is the way? Now this is the Lord talking to Job. 
Where is the way to the dwelling of light? And, and darkness, where is its place? So God's saying, where does light and darkness come from? Do you know that, Job? God does. And it says, that you may take it to its territory, that you may know uh, the path to its home. Do you know it? Because you were born uh, then, uh, or because of the number of your days is great. He's, he's reminding Job, when I created light and darkness, you weren't even around. You weren't even born back then. And, and so uh, he's letting him know, uh, you don't know what you think you know, but I do, Job. If you need the answers, I have the answers. It said, who has put wisdom in the mind? Uh, who has given, given understanding to the heart? Uh, today, uh, I tell people, they say, I wish I understood things about the Bible. I wish I understood God more. Proverbs tells us, if any of you let, uh, lacks wisdom, let him ask it from the Lord who will give it liberally. So uh, if we want to know something, uh, truly want to know it deep enough, if we'll begin to pray and seek God and study his word, God will reveal these things to us. And it says, uh, who has put wisdom in the mind or has given understanding to the heart? Who can number the clouds by wisdom or who can pour out the bottles of heaven? He's saying, Job, I, I can make it rain when the earth needs rain. Can you do this? And, and we all know the answer. Uh, and Job is, is at this point, he is very quiet, just like me and you probably would be. We wouldn't be saying anything. We'd be on our face before God if he was speaking to us. And, and God says, you can't make it rain, but I can. He says, when the dust hardens in clumps and the clods cling together, he said, I know when it needs to rain. I can tell from the way the earth is formed and how hard it's getting. I know when rain needs to come. You don't know those things, Job. And Job 39 and 1, it says, Do you know the time when the wild mountain goats bear their young? Or uh, can you mark when the deer uh, gives birth? And God said, I, I know all these things, Job. And do you know why I know these things? I'm the creator. I'm the one that gave them their instinct. I know when they're going to do these things, and you don't. He said, Can you number the months that they fulfill? Or do you know the time when they bear their young? Have you given the horse strength? Have you clothed his neck with thunder? Does the hawk fly by your wisdom, Job? Or does it spread its wings toward the south? Does the eagle mount up at your command and make its nest on high? In Job 31 and 1, it says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? For what is the allotment of God from above and the inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is it not destruction for the wickedness? See, this is what we need to be preaching and teaching people today. Uh, wickedness or sin is a reproach to any nation or any people, and it brings destruction. The scripture says, in the end, when sin is conceived, it brings forth death and destruction. So it says, is it not destruction for the wicked and disaster for the workers of iniquity? Does he not see my ways and count all my steps? Uh, the Bible tells us that the steps of the righteous man are ordered by the Lord. God knows just how to steer us. Have you ever ended up in a place and you wonder, what in the world am I doing? I've never been here before and I didn't plan on coming here today. And maybe you meet somebody and you begin to witness to them about the Lord. And uh, from that, maybe they get saved. God has a way of placing us and putting us in the path of people at the right place and the right time, he directs our steps. Uh, it, it, so it says, and he counts all my steps. If I have walked with falsehood or if my foot has hastened to deceit, let me be weighed on honest scales that God may know my integrity. Job was saying, Lord, I might be a little frustrated right now. I've lost my children. I've lost everything I own. My friends have turned against me. My wife has turned against me. But this one thing I know, God, you can judge me because you know my heart. And no matter whether you're a child of God or whether you're a rank sinner today, God knows the heart of each and every man. He is able to see through us just like we were a glass or transparent. God knows us inside and out. It said, let me be weighed on honest scales that God may know my integrity. Job 40 and 1, Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, 
Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer. He said, you've been talking, Job, and I've been hearing what you've been saying, but, but let me get this right. Are you really going to correct me, Job? Are you going to tell me the way that things should be? And, uh, man, it, it humbled. I mean, it humbled uh, Job. All of a sudden, all the trials didn't mean anything. The boils on him didn't mean anything. Losing the children didn't mean anything. Job is realizing that he is standing before the almighty creator uh, of the universe. And God says, uh, are, are, you know, I created you. Are you really going to try to rebuke me? Then Job answered the Lord and said, now, now this is when you know he got humble. Listen to what he says here. Behold, I am thou. What shall I answer you? I, and, and, and one place I read, it says, I lay my hand over my mouth. I covered my mouth. I spoke once. I shall not speak again. Why? Uh, Job is letting the Lord know, God, I realize I have um, I have overloaded myself a little bit. I've said things here I maybe I shouldn't be saying. And I spoke a while ago, but I'm going to shut my mouth now and listen to what you're telling me. And it says, he says, uh, what shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will uh, proceed no further. Job is saying, God, I recognize you for who you are, and I stand corrected. And he begins to change his attitude. And, you know, <laughs> wouldn't it be something? The Bible tells us to be like a man that is beholding himself uh, in water, his reflection, or a man that looks in a mirror. We need to take inventory sometimes, just like Job did here, and say, God, uh, in my life, there's some things that here lately, maybe I have not been doing them the best way, but but let me, uh, let me tell you, God, I realize who you are and who I am, and I repent. Uh, I want to turn away from that, and, and I want you to forgive me. Now, that's when the blessing of the Lord can come upon us. Um, and let's go back here. Uh, you know, earlier we talked about how God even cared for his creation, not just humans, but the animals as well. Uh, it said, does God value the lives of animals and, uh, and cattle and things? The answer is yes. Uh, and uh, that's found in Jonah chapter 4, verse 11. Uh, let's look at this. It says, um, let me look here. This verse is God's explanation to Jonah. Now, here, here's God speaking to Jonah. He's, he just spoke to Job a moment ago, but now we're going back and looking at the story of Jonah where the Lord spoke to him. And, uh, you know, God corrected him too because he let him be in the belly of a fish for three days. So he, he knew how to humble Jonah as well. It said, this verse is God's explanation to Jonah for why he did not choose to destroy the city of Nineveh. You know, uh, God had called Jonah to go preach to that great city, Nineveh, and uh, uh, Jonah didn't want to go there because they were Gentiles, and he considered them heathens, and he, he didn't want to go and share the gospel with them. But you, God, God didn't ask Jonah to go. He told him to go, and we need to be obedient to God's word. When he uh, tells us to do something, we need to do it. And, and here it says, there were 120,000 children in the city, they did not reach the age of moral accountability. They didn't know right from wrong. And God said, also, there's much cattle there. So not only did God care for the little children, but he also, the Lord himself mentioned, there's also a lot of cattle there. And if I destroy that place, I'm going to be killing innocent babies and innocent animals. Do you really want me to do this, Jonah? And uh, he says, the, uh, the, let's go back here. It said the, God said there's a lot of cattle there and the small children in Nineveh and the cattle were not guilty of the sins of the adults in that city. Uh, we are not surprised that God had pity for small children, but many people are surprised that God had pity for the cattle in Nineveh. But see, God created those animals. And think, when the flood took place, he cared enough for the animals he wanted to make sure that they continued on the face of the earth. So he, he had them come in two by two so they could replenish the earth after the flood. God cares about his creation. Let's look here. God governs heaven and earth. God governs natural events. 
Uh, and, and people have asked, where is God in the middle of tornadoes or in the middle of earthquakes or uh, the, the things that we've been seeing? Uh, you know, all these things like the, um, well, well, you know, like Haiti has experienced and all the, like this pandemic, where is God? God's right in the middle of his creation. His spirit is here in the earth. And Jesus told us, he said, it's expedient for me to go away. For when I go away, I can send the Holy Spirit to you. So God's spirit is here, but our sins are literally bringing consequences on the earth. And it's moaning and travailing like a woman in childbirth. And God cares for us, but he knows, it said, be sure your sins will find you out. There's consequences for the things uh, that we do. So let's go back here. It said, Job did not know the size of the shape uh, of the earth, but God did. Job could not explain what light or darkness is, and neither can we, by the way. All we know is that it happens, but God knows. Job did not know how snow or hail forms in the cloud, but God knows. Job did not know uh, God's method or operation by which he scatters light over the whole earth and causes the winds to blow over the whole earth. God inquired of Job, who has made rivers and streams? Who makes lightning and thunder and causes it to rain where no human resides and refreshes the earth? In places where there's not even a man, God's still taking care of the earth and the animals. It said, who makes the cold that produces ice and frost and makes the surface of the sea to freeze hard as stone? We cannot make it rain or snow and we cannot make it hot or cold. We cannot make it wet or dry. We cannot make lightning and thunder. We cannot dump rain on the earth to cut the courses of rivers. And Job realized, like we do, that God presides over natural events. Uh, let's look at a question for application here. It said, why are God's questions an excellent way for him to reveal to us how little we know about everything in contrast to his infinite knowledge about everything? Because as he asked Job questions, it showed Job, you don't have all the answers. Job didn't have an answer for anything that God was asking him. Why? He was not there to know the answers, uh, but God was. It said, with all the knowledge that humans have acquired, we still live very much at the mercy of the forces of nature. We see these hurricanes and things, Millions of people out of lights. Some of them down on the coast are still out of lights as we're talking tonight because uh, a storm hit that they weren't even expecting a few days earlier, and, and, and it shut them down. Everything stopped because they don't have any lights. They don't have any air. A lot of places don't have water that they can drink. People are taking water in because the forces of nature, there's nothing we can do. Uh, when the storm comes, we get caught up in it. Only God controls the storm, and he is all-powerful. So let's, let's go to response of the word here. It says, people can be heard to say, we can do anything that we set our mind to do. While this statement may be well-intentioned, it is not true because there's things we cannot do. God governs the heaven and the earth and the whole universe and under God's government, there are many things we can do or there are many things that we cannot do. We have no control over the rotation of the earth, the movement of the sun, the moon, the planets, and the stars. We have ventured into the edge of space, but we cannot travel to distant stars and planets light years removed from us. Our living habits may have some slight influence on the climate, but we cannot control the weather, we cannot keep earthquakes from happening, and we cannot keep volcanoes from erupting. Ultimately, God is the creator. He's the governor of the universe, and we are wise to acknowledge our dependence on his gracious providence. What is providence? Uh, it's, his, it's his protection and care for us. We're only here because God cares and he allows us to exist. It says, uh, we have to acknowledge his gracious providence for our existence in this world. Uh, let's, let's go further here. Uh, more questions for application. In what ways do you think it enriches our trust in and relationship with God 
when we appreciate the fact that God created and cares for animals? And in what ways do you think it will affect the way we treat animals if we appreciate the fact that they were created by God and are sustained and cared for by God's providence again? Uh, because if, it, you know, my thinking is this, if God cared for the animals, if God created the animals, during the flood, God made a way for the animals to board the ark and for them to exist today. We should care for God's creation and, and we should admire what the Lord has done. It said, when the floods came, God preserved with Noah and his family a remnant of animals to repopulate the earth. Humans always have and still do derive many benefits and pleasures from having animals on earth. This is God's will, and we should thank him for it and be partners with God in genuine appreciation for all that he has created. Uh, let, let's go back here to uh, talking about Job and his friends for a moment. It says, this passage of scripture is a part of Job's final reply to his three friends, uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, who had become his severe Critics, isn't it funny how people can be your friend one minute and turn on you and say, "You're surely you're a rank sinner. You've done something against God," and they begin to falsely accuse. People are so quick to turn. You know that's what happened when Jesus was crucified. One day they were screaming and shouting, "Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord!" And in less than forty-eight hours, they're screaming, "Crucify him!" People have a tendency to be kind of. Fickle. So, you know, we don't put our, our hope in man. We put our hope in God. So let's go back here and look. It says, his friends had become his severe critics and accusers. At the conclusion of Job chapter 31 and the beginning of Job 32, uh, there are these words. The words of Job are ended. So Job spoke, but then he stopped speaking. Do you know when we stop speaking, that's when God can talk to us. That's when he gets our attention. It said, so these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. In fact, Job's three friends had misjudged him and falsely accused him of wrongdoing. Job was not righteous, really, in his own eyes, but he knew that God and not his three friends and his wife was his judge. Uh, he knew that God knew the truth about him. As long as we are right with God, man's opinion should never sway us one way or the other. It's God that we need to please. Amen? It said, in fact, Job was not being punished by God for wrongdoing, but Job's faith in God was being tested by Satan. And this was a test that Job had to pass. What if Job had a, when his wife said, you should curse God and die, what if he would have thought, I've lost my children, I've lost my wealth, my friends have turned against me, my wife turned against me? What if he had just stopped, thrown his hands up, and began cursing God? He would have lost his soul, too, to go along with all those earthly possessions that he had lost. But Job maintained his integrity, and he passed the test. And there's a test. I talked about the test. Um, well, I talked about how God will test us this last Sunday, and in a few Sundays uh, from now, I'm going to talk about how uh, the things that we can do to know that we are in right standing. This is a test that we must pass. We want to make sure that we get to heaven. Amen. Questions for application. When we say that God is the judge and the ruler of our life, in what ways does this signify he is sovereign in our life? Why is the fact that God is our judge and ruler, why is that a comforting thing to people like Job, who has been misjudged and falsely accused by well-meaning but ill-informed people, because it's only God's judgment and not man's judgment that counts. I've been judged by people so many times. What if I had a gave up and just throwed my hands in the air and ever lie that's ever been told on me in my life that I would have let people prevail and I would have bought into that and I'd have got bitter? I would have lost the blessings of God. But we don't, need to, we don't need to put our hope and our confidence and trust in men. We need to put our confidence in God. It said, trust in the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. That's who I'm trusting in today, and that's who you should be trusting in. Trust in the Lord. 
In the bad times, trust in the Lord. In the good times, trust in the Lord and give him praise and thanks for the things that he has done. So it says God knows uh, everything. It says these verses are a small part of God's reply to Job. Many statements and questions are in the book of Job. God reminded Job that a human cannot instruct or reprove or correct him. This was such a startling reminder to Job, and he immediately replied to God, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Job had spoken at length his own opinions, but now he resolved to keep silent and listen to God. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we did that in our lives? that when God speaks, we remain silent and we don't try to justify the wrong and the things that we've done. You live in a society today that people want to be justified. In every kind of sin, in every wicked lifestyle that they've got, they want to be justified and they want us to accept them as being a good moral person. Well, the Bible speaks against these things and if God's word is against it, you and I are never going to change it. His word remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God is the ultimate authority and judge. So God knows everything with his complete knowledge. He rules over humans. And there's comfort in this for those who love and obey God. But for those who sin and refuse to repent, there is only fear. Because if we don't repent... We don't accept Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, and we don't acknowledge that God is our creator and he is sovereign in our lives. There's no way that we can go to heaven. It says, response to the word, God rules over all people and events with sovereign, supreme, and perfect authority and power and knowledge. Within the framework of his sovereignty, God has granted us the freedom to make choices that determine what our own lives will be. If we choose to live uh, with faith in and love for and obedience to God, his good will for our lives uh, will always be accomplished. But for those who choose not to live for God, his overruling will for the ultimate outcome of human history will still be done, but they will be excluded themselves from the accomplishment of God's good will for their lives. So to not choose God is to not choose heaven. Uh, I want to read two uh, last things here, then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, the call to discipleship and ministry in action. As it relates to Christian uh, discipleship, the fact that God created everything and rules over and cares for his whole creation means that we must have the desire and willingness to see what God is doing not only in our lives, but in all the world around us. Seeing what God is doing, we are to respond to his actions with submission and cooperation or obedience. And, and you know, we don't like, the flesh does not like to submit. But you know that you are growing in the Lord and the power of his, his might when you begin to, to surrender the will of your flesh for the will of his spirit that lives in you. Let's look at ministry in action, and then we will go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, seeing that God cares for his whole creation, we minister to God or worship him by conducting our lives responsibly according to the Holy Scriptures in relation to all that God uh, has created. Uh, let's look here. In doing, uh, in doing this, we, will, uh, we are not only doing what is pleasing to God, but also what is best for ourselves and for others. So, uh, you know, we have to believe that. We have to believe that God cares. Uh, we have to believe that he uh, loves us as his creation, and he has a perfect plan, like it says in Jeremiah 29 and 11. I know the thoughts that I think concerning you. God thinks about us. God is concerned for us, and God cares about us. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you, God, for all that you do in our lives. Sometimes things we don't even realize, God, but you're moving, Lord. We thank you, God, that you cared enough for us to send your son, that he would come and die and be the ultimate sacrifice for us. 
That shows us as your creation that you care for us. And, and it says in John three seventeen, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So you cared enough that you bridged the gap over our sins and you made a way that we could have eternal life. I pray that everyone under the sound of my voice, God, they would acknowledge you for who you are, realize who they are, that they are loved by you. Touch our people, touch our church, and help our church to be an outreach to our community, Father. In Jesus' name, we'll give you the praise, honor, and glory for it. Amen. Be blessed, church.